Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, New Spirit Baptist Church. Good morning, visitors, families, and friends. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning for English service. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to open up the service with a Bible reading. If you could please turn your Bibles to Psalm 118, verses 24 through 29. Psalm 118, 24 through 29. And the word of the Lord says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Blessed be the word of the Lord. Amen. If you'll go with me in prayer so we can open up the service. Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for another day, Lord, to come together and to worship your mighty name, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to reach out, Father, Lord, to family and friends and to the visitors watching, Lord. Lord, we uh, ask that you just bless this service, that you bless their lives, Father, Lord. Lord, we just uh, ask that you give us all an ear to hear what it is that you have for us this day. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. morning church how are you amen it's palm sunday amen what a wonderful time to be with the lord not necessarily in the house but wherever you are at if you're gathered in his name he is there with you amen we should never stop celebrating our father we should never stop celebrating the sacrifice of our king amen circumstances that are going on in the world, they don't matter. There's been plagues and famines and disease and pestilence since the beginning. There's nothing different today except today we can have the vehicle of repentance. He paved the way. He came through the city triumphant knowing what he was going to do for us. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Yeah, 
that is so good. If you were to stop and count just all the reasons you have to praise the Lord, I don't even know what that number would be. Amen? Amen. If your heart is for the Lord, you could stop and there'd be at least 10,000 just in the first day that you calculated it. Amen? He's alive and well. He sits on the throne and his hand of protection is upon his people. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Amen? Amen. We lift him up today. We lift him up tomorrow. But we celebrate his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem.
Amen. Good morning, New Spirit Baptist Church. Amen, amen. Bless the Lord, all my soul. Amen. Just a few announcements to share with everyone. And again, we want to thank all of you all for joining us on this online service. Uh, we'd like to thank our, our members who are joining by uh, virtual means, as well as all of our uh, family and friends and visitors. Welcome. Welcome to New Spirit Baptist Church. Just a few announcements to share with everyone. Uh, we are continuing also with our Wednesday Bible studies. Uh, Pastor Irby is presenting Wednesday evening Bible studies. Those start promptly at 6.55 on Wednesday evening. If you haven't already, we are utilizing the Zoom app. So uh, please join us. Uh, consider joining us. That is an interactive Bible study. So you do have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, it's a wonderful way. It's, I mean, it's basically, just like being here on Wednesday evening uh, with our pastoral team and doing Bible studies and learning and growing together uh, with the Word of God. Amen. So we encourage you all to join us on Wednesday evenings at 6.55 for an interactive Bible study uh, with the pastor. Also, uh, we do want to uh, acknowledge our prayer wall. Uh, we do have a prayer wall. We are continuing to pray for those needs. If you out there have a need, please contact the church. Let us know what that is. We'd love to pray for you or with you as well. So please contact us. I know that this is during a time when so many people, you know, unfortunately, um, aren't working. I know there's a lot of anxiety uh, about the situation. And, and even believers, uh, there are even believers who, you know, if you feel that, that your faith is low, please reach out. Let us pray with you. We want to help you with it. Uh, increasing your faith and just knowing that God's hand of protection and provision is over you and your families. Amen. So just uh, please reach out and let us know. We'd love to hear from you and pray with you. Also, uh, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness uh, with your tithes and offerings. Uh, we are receiving the online giving. We are receiving checks by mail. Thank you so much for your faithfulness uh, and may God bless you and your household. Uh, here in a little bit, I'll be praying over the offering once again um, for this Sunday. But uh, I just want to make that comment and let you know that we are receiving that. And so thank you for that as well. Other than that, I do want to mention uh, we do have a few uh, birthdays in the month of April. I know that uh, for our church members, we won't be together uh, this month of April to celebrate. Uh, but we do have some birthdays. And uh, we just want to acknowledge those of you who are having an April birthday that are members of our church. Uh, happy birthday. We love you. We miss you. We miss seeing your, your smiling faces here in the church. And uh, we look forward to the day that we can all get together once again. Uh, but again, uh, we do have those, I want to say, listed uh, on our Facebook page. And if we don't have them yet, we will get those on there. But uh, we are acknowledging your birthday. So happy birthday to all of you for the month of April. At this time, uh, what I would like to do is just say a quick prayer over the offering. Uh, I don't know, do we have another song for after? No? Okay. So what I'm going like, to do is I'm going to say a quick prayer over the offering, and then we'll get started with uh, today's sermon. And uh, for those of you who are here, uh, after I say the uh, offering or a prayer over the offering, if you'd like to uh, put those in the plate, we can do that real quickly before Brother gets started with the sermon. If you'll please go to the Lord with me in prayer. Father, Lord. Again, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence, Lord. We thank you, Father, Lord, for, for this worship service, Father, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the means that we have that you've made available so that we can reach out into the community, Father, Lord, and that we can still provide church with our members, Father, Lord, and our family and friends who are tuning in. Father, Lord, again, I just ask that you just be over the families, Father, Lord, that your spirit just overshadow them, Father, Lord, during this time. Lord, I pray that your hands of protection and provision be over them and their families during this time, Father Lord. And we know that you are a sovereign God and that you are a loving God, Father Lord. And we know that you will meet our needs, Father Lord. You always have and you've never failed us, Father Lord. And we thank you for that. Lord, we just ask that you just be with our leaders of our nation and leaders of this world, Father Lord, during this time, Father, that you just continue to provide them with wisdom, Father Lord. Uh, Father Lord, we just 
pray for them, Father Lord. We lift them up to you, Father Lord. What a burden that they must be carrying at this time, Father Lord. But we know here again that you are a mighty God and that you are still on the throne and that you are still in control. And we praise your name for that. Father Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in the life of the church. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Uh, before uh, I begin with the message, there's a couple of things I would like to uh, share with you. I want to remind you that our church has a new website as of last week. Uh, Madi, if you can, if you can pull it up. This is our new uh, webpage. If uh, you would like to uh, uh, go and visit uh, our webpage, uh, I believe it is uh, new, uh, newspiritbaptistchurch.org. Newspiritbaptistchurch.org. Go there and check it out. Uh, we have uh, 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 several pages there for you to see our ministries. We have online giving available there. So if you would like to offer a tithe to uh, support our church, you can go to the online giving and there uh, you can um, follow the, uh, the instructions. But basically it's simple. You just put in the amount you would like to give, put in the card information, and uh, uh, that will go directly to us. And we appreciate any uh, offerings that are given. Uh, also, when uh, I tell you we have a, a page for uh, Espanol, es, uh, Especificamente. So if you want to know a little bit more about our Spanish services, it's there. Uh, and, of course, our ministries as well. So uh, more importantly, there's also a page for contacts. Uh, if you go to that page on contacts, you can write there any prayer requests. And so as our, our deacon, our brother Val, was mentioning, if you have prayer requests, we want to stay connected with you. So we don't want to just want to make this a one-way communication, but a two-way. So that is why we're offering on Wednesdays the Bible interactive Bible study so that we can communicate with you. But also, we offer this uh, to you so that as you go uh, to the contact services, you're able to send an email to us any prayer requests that you have. We want to pray for you and we want to pray with you. So I wanted to uh, share that with you as well. And uh, one other thing I want to share, and this is a message just to uh, all of our members at New Spirit, the people that we normally see here on Sundays. I want you to know that we miss you and that we're praying for you. Uh, we remain encouraged and we know that the Lord is with us during this time. But I want you to know that um, the Lord has shown me something. Uh, there was a time not so long ago when I was perfectly con content with going into my library and closing the door and just reading books for hours on end and just fine. I told myself I could just be here for days and, 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 and be fine if nobody bothered me. But you know what the Lord has shown me is that I really miss my, my church flock. I miss the hugs and the, the greetings. I miss the handshakes. I, I miss the smiles. And the Lord has shown me that for all my love of books and learning and studying God's word, I miss my flock the most. And I love them more than anything, any book or anything out there. So I want you to know that I'm praying for you, that I love you, and that my heart aches to see you again. Um, but we'll be together again soon. And I just want to encourage all of you out there, whether I see you here personally or whether um, we see each other through uh, electronic means, I want you to know that you're loved and you're missed and that we're praying for all of you out there. So I wanna encourage you to, to stay uplifted and to know that through this, that the Lord will be glorified and that uh, the churches are strengthened and it is a time now more than ever for us to remain rooted in God's word. With that being said, I'm gonna uh, ask you, if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn to the book of Matthew chapter 21, verses one to 17. The book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. The word of the Lord says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, <clears throat> Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went 
and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put, them, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Lord Father, I thank you for the privilege to preach your word today. I pray that you equip me. I pray that your spirit and your presence be felt here and for all those who hear. Lord, I ask a special blessing for all those who are tuning in. May your spirit reside over their households. May it reside over their lives, Lord. May you be with them. May you connect us through your spirit. And may you speak to me and through me to those who receive this. Let it not be my words, O oh Father. Let it be yours. Lord, you know I'm nervous. I'm nervous because I feel unworthy to bring the message of your gospel. And I feel like it is such a magnificent, a magnificent message. And I just feel like sometimes I can't do it justice. So Lord, I pray for your help to bring this message in the glory and in the honor that it deserves. I thank you in Jesus name. Amen. You know, in my short life, I have uh, had the privilege of witnessing events and moments that I knew that at that moment, there was something truly historical happening at that moment. For example, I remember certain sporting events growing up. For example, I remember the day when Emmett Smith, for those of you that remember him, he was the Dallas Cowboys running back, and I'm a big Dallas Cowboys fan. When Emmett Smith broke the all-time leading rushing record, I still remember the run when he runs through and then he trips and he falls and he gets up and he starts celebrating. I remember watching that game and telling myself, I, I just watched history unfold. And I remember growing up uh, seeing Michael Jordan play. And I remember just watching all of the championships and just the, the things that he did. And I still remember that one time when he goes up to dunk the ball, then he switches hands and he does a little layup. And I remember the coach just smiling and in disbelief at the talent. I remember saying, I got to see one of the greatest basketball players. And then in his retirement, then I saw LeBron James come in and I thought, wow, here comes the next the torch to be passed, and I know I'm about to see something truly special with this guy, and sure enough, I did. And I remember Tiger Woods winning the first Masters, and I was just starting to play golf, and when he won that first tournament, I went, something tells me he's going to win a whole lot more, and sure enough, he did. I knew I was watching sports history. And in movies, I remember some of the big movies coming out, and I still remember in the 70s, yes, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but I remember when Star Wars came out, not the new ones. I mean the, the ones that, that date you back a little way. The back in the 70s. And I remember people would dress up like Chewbacca and all these. And some people would just look like Chewbacca. But they'd be out there uh, camping for days so they could get tickets to go into the movies. And I remember saying, they're making cinematic history. It was truly something historical. And when I think of sociopolitical events, I remember watching on TV President Ronald Reagan standing before the Berlin Wall. And I remember him saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And not long after that, the Berlin Wall being torn down. I still remember that. And families who had been separated for generations finally getting to meet each other and just weeping as they held each other. I remember those scenes. How many of you still remember where you were in 2001, September 11th? How can we forget the day that the towers came down? And in my personal life, there are moments, and in yours as well, when you know that there's something happening in your life that's going to change your life forever. 
When I was married that day, I knew my life is never going to be the same again. When my children were born, every time I knew my, chi my, my child is going to change my life. And when I received the call to ministry, I knew my life would be different. And when I answered that call, and how, of course, can we forget when my wife and I received the call to begin and initiate New Spirit Baptist Church, we knew that life would never be the same. I think all of us can look in our life and say that we were part of history and we witnessed history. But you know what the challenge is of experiencing history at that moment? There's a challenge to it. And I think that the challenge is, is that it's almost impossible to appreciate it in its full capacity at that moment because you don't know how it's going to unfold. And I think that sometimes it's not until we look back and go, wow, I really saw something historical. So it's so hard to experience it at that Monday. Well, where are you going with this, Irby? Today is Palm Sunday. How can I not preach about the fact that our coming king arrives into Jerusalem today. It is Palm Sunday. There's a reason why there's palms here. Next week, we will be discussing the resurrection. Next Sunday is resurrection. How can I not preach about the coming king? How can I not preach about Palm Sunday? How can I not preach about the coming resurrection? This is a Sunday before the resurrection. And it's called Palm Sunday because it was on this day that Jesus, as we just read, comes to Jerusalem from the east. And he rides on a donkey, and he's greeted by shouts of praise. And the people lay out their cloaks, and they go and they cut down palms, palm branches, and they spread them out before him, shouting Hosanna in the highest. And even though most Christians, I think that they can explain this basic meaning, I wonder how many people truly understand the full weight and the grandeur of this event. How many people really understand what's happening? I wonder if people understand and know that Palm Sunday is much more than just Jesus coming to Jerusalem. I wonder if people know that it's much more than the fact that it's initiating Jesus' final week. I wonder if people understand that it means much more than his triumphal entry or that it means more than just the palm branches that were laid down. Did you know that? Did you know that there's more to this message about Palm Sunday than what we just read? We have to read and dig deeper. I wonder how many people know that on this day, Palm Sunday, the Shekinah glory of God finally returned to Jerusalem after over 600 years of absence. I wonder how many people know that. So here we see Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This is the final week of his life. By this time, next Sunday, Jesus will have been betrayed, he will have been arrested. He will have been beaten. He will have been flogged, crucified, buried, and risen for the whole world to witness. And as they draw near to the eastern entrance of Jerusalem, at the Mount of Olives, he sends the disciples to go and find this donkey and her young colt and bring them to him, specifically to the village ahead. Don't just go looking anywhere. Go there, and there you will find the donkey that awaits me. And Jesus enters Jerusalem riding a donkey, and it's foretold by the prophet Zechariah. It's a symbol that the king of kings would not arrive in extravagance and splendor, but in meekness and humility. And more so, Jesus is fulfilling prophecies of Zechariah. It reveals to the world that he is indeed the Messiah. So he's not just going to get a donkey because he doesn't want to walk. He's fulfilling a prophecy given by the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. I want you to notice verse 3. It says, If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. When Jesus sends these disciples to go and get this donkey and her young colt, Matthew isn't just inserting this message. If they ask you who needs it, you tell them that the Lord needs it. He's not adding that just to, to embellish the story. He's not there just for additional information. This is royal speech. It's royal speech because did you know that kings had the right to, requis uh, to requisition property, animals, if they so needed? Did you know that? It was called Angorea, and it reveals the right of a king if they go through a village or a town, and if they need horses, if they need food, if they need material, they say, in the name of the king, I confiscate, I requisition this. For the king's use. And here Jesus is uttering words of royalty. 
using the right and privilege of Angarea, saying, if they ask you why, who needs this? You tell them the Lord needs it. In other words, the king has requested the use of your donkey and her young colt. And Matthew points to this event as an Old Testament prophecy. Notice what it says here. It says in verse 4 through 5, This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, and Zion, of course, being Jerusalem, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Matthew is saying, this didn't happen just by chance. This was spoken and uttered long ago, centuries before, by the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. Go with me to the book of Zechariah, if you have your Bibles with you, and go to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Here, the prophet Zechariah, over 400 years before the coming of Christ, says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. This is Jerusalem. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Here is Zechariah's prophecy. It's much more than just saying the king will come and he will come riding on a donkey, but he will come having salvation. That is the fulfillment and the fullness of that prophecy. And then in Zechariah chapter 14, he adds something else. On the coming day of that day, that day when the Lord shall come, the coming day of the Lord, <clears throat> in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 through 4, he then utters these words. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. Do you see that? Zechariah not only prophesies how the Lord will come, but exactly from where. Go back with me to Matthew 21. And I want you to notice verse 1 of chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, that's where he approached. Do you know where where? Bethpage and Mount of Olives are located. It's located to the east of Jerusalem. He enters by the east. I want you to understand the significance of what's happening here. In Matthew 21, verse 9, as Jesus enters the eastern gate of Jerusalem, he's given a red carpet entrance. Notice what happens in verse 9. The people see him, and they go before him, and they follow him shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is a coronation reserved for only royalty. This was a shot of praise that was done only for royalty. Only given to the Lord. The people are acknowledging and crying out for Jesus to deliver them. When they say, and they will be delivered, not by a conquering king, but they will be delivered by a suffering servant. So what we see here is a blessing, a shout of praise for deliverance, for salvation, and they will indeed be delivered, but not by what they expect. And the people's cry of Hosanna, the people's cry saying, Hosanna in the highest, that comes from the Hallel Psalms, the Psalms of praise, and it's specifically Psalm 118, verses 25 to 26. And our brother Val read this to initiate the service. Psalm 118, 25 to 26. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. When it says save us there in the original Hebrew, it says Hosanna. It is the Aramaic translation, Hoshiana, which means save me. So what's happening here in their shouts of praise, these people are, are, are praising the Lord as he comes in. They, they throw their, their, their cloaks on the, on the roads for him to come over. They go and they rush and they tear out these, 
these uh, 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 saw, uh, palm branches and they throw them on the ground. They're giving them a red carpet entrance and they're shouting, Hosanna, Hoshiana, save us, O Lord, for you are the one that's delivered to us to praise. You are the one delivered to save us. But I wonder, do they really understand what's happening here? Do they truly understand the significance in that moment of the historical event? Do they see what's happening and truly appreciate what they see? I would argue to you that they don't, that they truly don't understand. How do I know that? I want you to look at, going back to Matthew 21, I want you to look at what immediately happens after they shout their praises and after Jesus enters. In verse 10, chapter 21, and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Can you see that? Can you see the people are coming in and they're flocking and they see this huge crowd and they're hearing all this praise. Hosanna in the highest praise to he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the people are coming and looking over there. What's going on? And they see him coming on. They're seeing the people throw the palm branches on the ground. And they go and they take their cloaks. They want to be a part of that. And they're singing and they join in. Hosanna the highest. Yes. And he leaves Hosanna the highest. Who was that? They really don't know who he is. They really truly don't understand the significance of this event. You know how I know? Not only about what I read in verse 10. But because on the Friday of this same week, this same crowd is going to call for his blood. You know, up to now, some of you are saying, Irby, you're saying that, that, that there's something special about this, that maybe I don't really understand the significance of Palm Sunday, but you're not telling me anything new. I already know all that. I already know about the significance of his entrance and all of the things that you told me. Well, I had to first give you the context and the historical background before I reveal to you what I'm now going to show you. You see, when you understand what I'm about to tell you, I think that then and only then are you going to truly understand what Palm Sunday really means. Let me ask you something. What is the first thing that Jesus does when he enters into Jerusalem? The answer is he goes straight to the temple. Notice verse 12 of Matthew 21, and Jesus entered the temple. Now, I don't want to talk right now about what he did when he got to the temple and all the activities. No, no, I want to stop and focus on the fact that Jesus went to the temple. It's almost like he went there with a specific mission in mind, and therein lies the true majesty of this event and what it meaning is. But in order to really appreciate it, you have to go with me to the book of Ezekiel. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 10. Let's get into a time capsule. Let's get into a time capsule and go 600 years in the past to the time of Ezekiel where over 600 years ago the prophet Ezekiel received a very disturbing vision. And as you hold on there in Ezekiel chapter 10, let me tell you, at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, it says that in the 30th year, the fourth month, on the fifth day, the heavens were opened and Ezekiel saw something truly terrifying. There were four angels called cherubim, magnificent creatures. And there, in the midst of these angels, came the glory of the Lord descending upon him. Truly terrifying. And Ezekiel received this vision about five years after King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had come and destroyed Jerusalem. And they had taken all the people prisoners and they went to the temple and they tore it down completely. They raised it to the ground. The house of the Lord was gone. And as the people were led in chains and there was blood everywhere and just the fire and everything was destroyed. They looked over at the temple, the place where God dwelt. And they saw nothing but rubble. And Ezekiel is part of this group that's taken away captives. And the people are confused and they're lost and they don't understand what's happening. They're in shock and they're saying, how could this be? How could God let this happen? This was his house. This was his city. How could he let his home, 
his temple be destroyed. And there was this identity crisis happening. And then, in the midst of all this, five years later, God decides that he's going to speak. And he's going to elect Ezekiel, his prophet. I'm going to choose him to talk to Israel and tell them exactly why what happened happened. And here, Ezekiel receives this vision. But not only does he give them an explanation, he also gives them a promise. And before we read in, in uh, chapter 10, let me tell you that in the opening chapters of Ezekiel, God explains that the reason they've been, been taken prisoners and the reason Jerusalem was destroyed was because they were sinful. They didn't listen. He sent prophet after prophet, and they were ignored. They were, some of them were even murdered. And they refused to give up their idols. They refused to listen. They didn't take them seriously. And finally, he said, I've had enough. It's time. It's time to put the most important thing over your lives. You need the discipline and you need the refinement by fire because I'm not interested in your comfort. I'm interested in your character. And you have forgotten me. And he explains this to them in the opening chapters. And then chapter 5, verse 11, before we read in, in chapter 10, he says, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations. Therefore, chapter 5, verse 11, I will withdraw. So he says, I left. And then in chapter 10, verses 18 to 19, God takes Ezekiel back in time where Ezekiel sees something truly startling. See, God says, Ezekiel, I want, to, I want you to understand something. It hurt me to do so. It pains me to do this. But I withdrew from you because I cannot live with idolatry and sin. He left me no choice. I withdrew. And I want you to tell the nation of Israel that. And in verse 18 to 19, he says, I want to take you back, Ezekiel. I want, you to, I want to take you back and I'm going to let you see a vision of this temple. And he takes them back when the temple was still standing before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. He takes them back five years before. He says, I want, you to, I want you to watch this temple. And I want you to see what happens. And Ezekiel tells us, Then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim, the angels, and the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eye as they went out with the wheels beside them and they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them. Do you know what happened here? God takes Ezekiel. He says, watch. And he saw the glory of God leave. You know, um, for those of you that remember Elvis when he was popular, he would do his concerts and people were going crazy. And at the end of the concert, they would say, Elvis has left the building. So the people would know they could go home. Well, here, God had left the building. He says, Ezekiel, this is why it happened. Because I left. When Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed this temple, I wasn't there anymore. I had long since been gone. I departed from that building. And he lets him see this. And he says, now you go and you tell them this. But he doesn't leave Israel without hope. He tells them, this isn't the end of your story. Yes, you've been plucked from your homes. Yes, you, the, the, the city has been destroyed. Yes, the temple was raised to the ground. And you're everywhere and you think you're lost. But this isn't the end of your story. This is just the chapter. There will come a day when I will gather you again. And I will promise you that Israel will be reformed. And not only does he do that, he promises a day when he will once again return in his glory. Look at chapter 11 of Ezekiel, verses 17 through 20. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. It's going to come back. I'm going to bring you back again. And when they come there, they will remove from, all, from it all its detestable things and all its abominations and I will give them one heart and a new spirit. For those of you watching, if you ever wondered why we're called New Spirit Baptist Church, it's because there was a day when, Jesus, when God said, there will come a day when I will give you a new spirit and I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes 
and keep my rules and obey them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. So God gives them a promise. It says, it's not over yet. There will be a day when I will gather you again. There will be a day when my glory shall return to the temple. Matthew 23, verse 37. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus after he comes into the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, after he's greeted, remember, keep it in mind what was said here in Ezekiel, the promise that God said, there will be a day when I will gather you again, right? Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus looks and he laments over Jerusalem and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often, how long I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. He's referring to the day that God's glory left. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what's happening here, folks? Here in Matthew 23, 37, after he enters, Jesus is revealing that he is the fulfillment of the promise that God gave to Ezekiel over 600 years ago. Oh, and it gets better. Go back with me to Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 through 5. Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 through 5. And I want you to see the vision that God gives to Ezekiel on the day that he comes back to refill the temple with his glory. So Ezekiel is given a sneak peek. Ezekiel, I want you to see what it's going to look like on the day that my glory returns to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, remind me, from what direction did Jesus come? East. East, okay, thank you. Chapter 43, verse 1, then he led me to the gate. This is Ezekiel. The gate facing east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. And the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters and the earth shone with his glory. And the vision I saw was just like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city. And just like the vision that I had seen by the Kabar Canal. And I fell on my face as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. The spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. If you don't sense the majesty of that moment, if you don't understand that as Jesus walked into the temple, as Jesus came into the gates, the eastern gate of Jerusalem, that this was finally, finally the day when the promise given to Ezekiel, when the glory of the Lord would come back. I don't know what to tell you, but there is majesty here in this promise. It is truly stunning to understand the true meaning of what's happening here in Palm Sunday. Did you know that the Jews to this day are still waiting on this promise? Did you know that? Did you know that the Jews, at least those who have rejected Jesus as the Messiah, they're still looking to the east and they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. They missed it. They missed the fact that they're still waiting for what has already occurred on the day when the Shekinah glory, Shekinah in Hebrew means the presence, the Spirit of God, when the glory of the Spirit of God came back. Did you know that they're still waiting? And did you know that after the first temple, the temple that was built by the son of King David, Solomon, that one was the one that was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. Did you know that 70 years later, they do come back and they rebuild the temple. And this one was rebuilt by a Jewish leader named Zerubbabel, who 70 years rebuilt the second temple. And it stood there for about 500 years. And then King Herod came back and decided he was going to reconstruct the temple in glorious form. And he went and he just fixed it up, made it look as spectacular in all its splendor. And that was the temple that was standing there when Jesus showed up on that day. That was the temple. But do you know what really, really interests me? That there's never, anywhere, nowhere, a biblical mention, either for when 
the second temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel or when it was reconstructed by Herod, never, anywhere, nowhere where it says that then God's glory came back to fill the temple. You know what that tells me? That tells me that for over 600 years, this glorious second temple stood there, but without the presence and the glory of God filling it. It is not until the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem by the Eastern Gate, Palm Sunday, that was the day when the Shekinah glory of God finally returned to Jerusalem. And when he does return, what does he find? He finds his house turned into a den of thieves and robbers. Go back with me to Matthew 21. In verses 12 through 17, we see he finds nothing but a den of thieves and robbers. He finds people more interested in making money than in worshiping the Lord. He finds self-righteous priests and scribes that are ignoring the fact that they cared nothing for the blind, for the lame that were in the midst of them. They cared nothing for the lost. And so Jesus heals those that have been ignored for so long and he cleanses the temple. He overturns the tables and on that day, one final revelation is made and I cannot stop without showing you this final revelation, but you won't find it in Matthew. You're going to find it in John, the same account. Listen to what John says in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. So Jesus cleanses the temple. But notice how John tells it. In verse 13, John chapter 2, verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Do you have zeal for the house of the Lord? Notice verse 18. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So Jesus cleanses the temple. And he makes this final revelation that on that day, the Shekinah glory had returned, but didn't just return to that temple, but a declaration that a totally new temple was going to be formed. Jesus shows up and he sees this house in ruins. It's a house built by men. And he says, the Shekinah glory has returned, but not to this temple. Destroy this body and in three days it will be rebuilt. I am the new temple. It will be me that will be rebuilding this temple. And on that day, the Shekinah glory returns and declares a new temple, but it's not made of brick. It's not made of mortar. It's not made of wood, but of the living stones of the disciples of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse 16. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and I will walk among them and I will be their God. and They shall be my people. The temple is no longer in Jerusalem. To this day, it's destroyed. Did you know that about 40 years after Jesus was buried and resurrected, the emperor Titus and the Romans would come and they would raise it to the ground again. And to this day, there is no temple. And to this day, the Jews are still waiting for the day when the Messiah will come. They missed it. The new temple is indeed here. But you're not going to find it on the Temple Mount. You're not going to find it in some building. You're going to now find it in the believers of Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Amen. That is the new temple. It was Passover week in Jerusalem. Thousands of people were coming in. Did you know that the historical re records show that the average size of Jerusalem was around 70,000? But during Passover week, it swelled up to over 250,000. And during that day... I wonder how many people really understood the grandeur of the event that they witnessed. I wish I could have been there. You want to know what Palm Sunday really means? 
You want to know what today, this Sunday before resurrection, you want to know what today means? Today is the day when the Shekinah glory of God finally returned to Jerusalem, but not to the temple defiled by men, but a new temple, the temple built by Jesus, the temple made of living stones. That's what Palm Sunday means. May he be glorified in this. May his glory dwell forever in the new temple that is you and I. That is the meaning of Palm Sunday. I encourage you, for those who are listening and for those of you who are watching, I want you to examine and ask yourself, am I the temple of the living God? Has this temple been defiled by sin? Have I allowed my temple to, to be riddled with sinful activity? Have I let my temple get dirty with things? Today, I want to encourage you, clean out your temple. Purge the temple of the things that defile it. Let only the glory of God live in your temple. Let only the glory of God live in your life. Let nothing, let nothing stain it. That is the truth of what Jesus is declaring here. Let us live it. Let us practice it. Let us glorify it with our lives. Lord, Father, I thank you for this day and I thank you for this message. Let us remember on this beautiful, glorious Sunday, this Palm Sunday, when we understand the full meaning of what it means. Lord, it's more than just people throwing palms, palm branches at your feet. It's the day when your glory finally returned. And Lord, on this day, I pray that if there's anyone listening that hasn't received the message of Christ, aches to have that feeling, to know what it's like to have the glory of God living in them. Let them know that on this day that can happen. That all they have to do is acknowledge, Lord, that they need you. That on this day they would say a simple prayer. And if you're listening out there, just say this prayer with me. Lord, Father, I'm tired of my life without you. I'm tired of the sin and the stain. And Lord, I can't fix it. I've been trying to fix it, but I can't. So on this day, Lord, Father, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner I acknowledge that I have sinned. And Lord, Father, I acknowledge you not only as God and, and, and Lord, but as my Savior. I surrender to you. I render to you my life. I give all to you. And on this day, Lord, Father, I pray that you come into my heart and you make me new. Lord, make me your temple. Lord, Father, I believe that Jesus came to save this world. I believe that he was your son. I believe that he lives. And I believe that he died on a cross. He was dead and buried, but on the third day he rose again. I believe this, and I confess it. And I pray, Lord, that for those who have prayed this prayer, that they know, Lord, that they have invited your Holy Spirit to come into their lives. And I pray that you be with them, that you help them and guide them, and connect them with the church community. Lord, Father, I thank you for this message, and I pray that it glorifies your name. Lord, Father, you truly are worthy. And we thank you for the day when your Shekinah glory finally came back to the temple. May you be honored and glorified. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for all of you who tuned in. We continue to pray for you. Please log in www.newspiritbaptistchurch.org and leave us your prayer requests. Please reach out to us. We continue to pray for you. God bless. Bye, Alex.